Good morning. I like it when we have a smaller group sometimes. This is going to be a good conversation, I think, this morning. I also want to welcome those that are watching us online. For those in Tanzania, Caribou, welcome. We're glad that you are with us today as we talk about and launch our latest report on the power of fruits and vegetables to improve malnutrition or nutrition in Tanzania. You know, when I started at CSIS um, about four and a half, five years ago, I was told to pick a country and go do some field research and do some analysis on the US government's food and nutrition programs. And the country I chose was Tanzania. Um, so my first report that I authored here was on Tanzania. And it was a report called Tracking Promises. And in that report, I talked a lot about the untapped potential of Tanzania um, and also talked about the commitment of the government at the highest levels um, to agriculture and nutrition. And for any of you, if you've been to Tanzania, um, it sort of sticks in your heart. We had a dinner last night with a lot of nutrition experts and a lot of people who have worked in nutrition for decades um, and have worked on, on in Tanzania for decades. And I think it's a country that is very important to the United States. Um, and its, its progress, its growth, its development um, should be central to our development um, priorities. So this morning, as we, as we look at this report, if you've had a chance to look through it, um, you will see that it truly is one of the most colorful, vibrant reports I have ever seen at CSIS. In fact, I really think it's more of a magazine than a report. Um, if you look in the middle, you'll see one of my favorite parts of it is about the change makers. And so it kind of starts on page 30. But you'll see in there where you hear a stories of, from Edward Dodo, who was one of the first male nutritionists um, you know, teaching nutrition education. And it just goes on and on to talk about the beautiful people in Tanzania the colorful photographs that are used in this report are from a very talented um, photographer named Sala Lewis who joined um, Amy and Eilish, who I'll talk about in just a minute for this trip. Along with this lovely report that we're launching today, we also have an online digital interactive report that has even more imagery to help tell this story, um, and you can find that on the CSIS website. But I'd like to talk for a minute about Dr. Amy Baudreau. Amy, if you can wave your hand a little bit for me. Um, Amy is the author of this report, and Amy um, has been in a year-long research fellowship with us, and this is sort of her peak product, her peak day, um, as we talked about how what could we cover looking at um, the issue of malnutrition. And I'll say, having worked in this space over a decade, we talk a lot about you know, how are we going to increase the food production to feed the growing population? But a lot of times that conversation is around staple crops. It's not enough, uh, to me, around fruits and vegetables. And as we talk about the global, ri global rise of obesity and overweight, and we, think, we see these trends um, shifting in the world, um, we have to be thinking much, much more about what we are eating, what we are putting in our bodies. And that also, of course, goes to what we are growing, uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, have a much higher post-harvest loss rate. You know, they have, they're, they're under threat by climate change. And we really have to think through uh, what we are growing and the smallholders who are growing it. So I'm thrilled that, that Amy took on this project. So Amy, to you, congratulations. Um, you have been a wonderful asset to our team and to the nutrition community, and we're really grateful for your work here. I'd also like to thank Eilish Zimbilchi, who's probably running around downstairs right now helping get this event together. Um, Eilish, as our project um, coordinator and research assistant, traveled with Amy on this research project um, to Tanzania and worked very hard on this report and event, and we're grateful for her. And then as I was talking about the design and the colors and everything about the report, I'd also like to thank the brilliant Emily T. Meyer and our iLabs team here, our creative team, um, who's just done such a great job um, designing this report, um, as she has with many others. 
So uh, the report, as I keep emphasizing that it's quite different, because we wanted to tell the story, right? And to us, the story is sometimes that's about our policy wonk words and how we like to do a deep analysis. But it's also about the human face of this. It's about um, Edward. It's about the, the women, the farmers, the children, you know, the men of, of the people who are working on the ground to, to work on malnutrition issues. And really, we could not have a better person here to help us also tell this story than the former leader of the country. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce this morning as our keynote, the Honorable Mazingo Pinda. Um, he was the Prime Minister of the Republic of Tanzania from 2008 to 2014. I first met him in June of 2011. I was in Tanzania when I was working for USAID to help launch Feed the Future with the former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. I brought pictures of my time uh, and showed him last night during our dinner of, 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 of that launch. Um, and that launch, we held it at a women's cooperative um, out in a rural area. And of course, the women were growing vegetables. I remember tomatoes in a greenhouse. I remember carrots in the ground. Um, and as I spoke with, with Honorable Penda last night, I was reminded that he's a farmer himself. Um, he has 30 acres where he grows fruits and vegetables and has livestock and, and um, chickens. And now he's working on fish. Um, so he's a farmer. And he understands at the highest level the importance of nutrition. When I was there in 2011, that was also when the scaling up nutrition movement was starting. And Tanzania was one of the first signature, signatory countries to that. Um, and just from the highest levels, including in this report, the steering committee that he helped create on nutrition. And then, of course, now, as we see, after he's left government, he's decided to dedicate part of his time to continue to work on nutrition. He's the chairman of a foundation, which I'm sure he'll tell you more about, um, and he'll talk to a talk to us about his story and about nutrition and the story of nutrition in Tanzania. Honorable Pinda, it's a pleasure to have you at CSIS. The floor is yours. The management of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, nutrition and agriculture experts present in this room, all invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let me begin by thanking the management of the Global Food Security Project here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies for inviting me in my capacity as the chairman of a startup NGO, the Agri Thoman Foundation, to be a keynote speaker as we launch a report on fruits and vegetables to improve nutrition in the United Republic of Tanzania. I also thank all of you who spoke before me, Madam in particular, for your kind words and setting scene for my talk. More importantly, I want to take this chance to thank the government and the people of the United States of America for the cooperation with the Tanzania in many aspects aimed at improving the lives of the Tanzanians, in particular in the area of nutrition through various programs and projects in our country. Dear brothers and sisters, allow me before I proceed to deliver my short speech to introduce myself a little bit, you know, slightly more than Madam to told you. And it's important that you know a little bit of my background. In short, I'm a 1975 law graduate from the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And after my graduation, I joined the Attorney General's office, where I worked for only three years before being posted to State House, where I worked as Deputy Private Secretary to the President of the United Republic of Tanzania for 17 years. And later, as the Chief of the Cabinet Secretariat for five years, before I decided to join politics in the year 2000. Within the political life, I spent 15 years. During this period, I worked as a deputy minister for five years and full minister for three years 
in one area responsible for regional administration and local government's authority. And in 2008, as Madam said, I was appointed the Prime Minister of the United Republic of Tanzania and retired in 2015. It's also probably significant to point out to you that I've, as a result, been very lucky to have worked closely with all former presidents of my country, beginning with His Excellency, the late Mwalim Judas Kambarage Nyerere for seven years, whom I'm sure most of you know, His Excellency Ali Hassan Mwenyi for 10 years, His Excellency Benjamin William Kapp for 10 years, and His Excellency Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete for 10 years. It's clear from this short historical background that I'm not an expert of nutrition <coughs> like some of you are in this room. Yet, <coughs> it's the same history that has enabled me to be what I am today. I've learned a lot during my stay in these offices and created very special attention on some major problems confronting our country, one of which is nutrition. All we, as we all know, that 1,000 days for a child is a critical moment for, to define its future. Evidence has shown that missing those days is a missed opportunity for the children, families they come from, communities, and the nation at large. We also know that within 1,000 days, we have to start complementary feeding after six months of exclusive breastfeeding whereby fruits and vegetables become important and vital ingredients of diets for children during this critical stage. Yet again, women of reproductive age require fruits and vegetables for important minerals and vitamins to prepare them to become good and healthy mothers. This is even more so for adolescent girls who are future mothers. Indeed, fruits and vegetables are for all age groups, including us and particularly people of my age. Dear investigators, ladies and gentlemen, in Tanzania, we have put in place policies and strategies to find malnutrition. We have in particular embraced the multi-sector approach as a way to go. This is because nutrition is complex and as such, no one sector can address it alone. When I was still in the office as Prime Minister of the United Republic of Tanzania, I launched the National Nutrition Strategy in 2011, which was implemented until 2015. During this time, I championed the process of Tanzania becoming one of the first few countries to join the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, commonly known as SUN. My office also spearheaded the formulation of a multi-sectoral, multi-partnership platform to oversee implementation of the strategy. At the time, Stunting rates for under five was 42%. With good effort by the government and other key stakeholders, stunting rates fell to 34.7% by 2015, and the recent data of 2018 show further decline to 31.8%. This declining trend is encouraging, but rates are still high especially when we look at the absolute numbers. Dear invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, when we look on the production of vegetables in Tanzania, we see an increase from 1,041,375 tons in 2015 to 1,595,489 tons in 2018. Similarly, fruit production has increased from four million five seven four two forty tons in 2015 to five million two forty three three forty three tons in 2017. In terms of food security, Tanzania has made some good progress. As for the past five years, food sufficiency ratio is recorded at the average of 115 <clears> percent. <throat> what we have seen, however, is that even regions with high food production still suffer from chronic malnutrition, signifying that diet diversification among women of reproductive age and children under five requires a much bigger improvement. Dear friends, new data from Tanzania National Nutrition Survey 2018 show that 
86.9% of children from six to eight months had a timely introduction of complementary feeding. However, the proportion of children aged six to 23 months who received four or more foods group was only 35%. Although this is an improvement compared to 2014 data, which was 24.5%, more needs to be done in this particular area. In most cases, fruits and vegetables are the food groups that tend to be sidelined in most of our common areas in our country. With the launch of the National Multisectoral Nutrition Action Plan 2016-17 to 2020-21, we have seen an emphasis on the complementary feeding and diet diversity, including emphasis on fruits and vegetables in our diets. We have seen a number of projects on the home and school garden being implemented. Through Feed the Future program, Mwanzobora project, which was implemented in three regions, opened up a number of opportunities in home and school gardens, and slowly it is encouraging to see households taking it as an opportunity to improve their diets and income. I, however, wish to take this opportunity to reaffirm the importance of strategic nutrition interventions such as this to prioritize regions with the highest malnutrition burden. Hence, the 2018 Tanzania National Nutrition, Nutrition Survey report has listed 11 regions out of 25 in the mainland Tanzania as priority. These are Kagera, Kigoma, Dodoma, Geita, Tanga, Ruvuma, and Mbea, followed by Mara, Morogoro, Dar es Salaam, and Tabora. Dear friends, the government of Tanzania has further proven its commitment at ending malnutrition in the country by introducing a nutrition budget line in all ministries and mandatory allocation of two shillings 1,000 for every child under the age of five years by every council in the country. This contributed tremendously to the recorded progress on the ground. Investing in adolescents has a number of advantages. One, that the science is proving that adolescents may be a second window of opportunity after 1,000 days window. This means we may recover some of the lost things during early ages. And secondly, this group will become parents in the near future and therefore requires the preparations. Indeed, for the girls in most developing countries, Tanzania included, there has been an increase of teen pregnancies. Thirdly, Adolescents may have a big influence in the household they come from and spearhead the establishments of fruits and vegetable gardens and home consumption. Another justification for this is that the fact that about 43% of Tanzania's population is under 15 years of age, we have collectively, co collectively got to address adolescents' nutrition in Tanzania. Dear invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's also worth noting that among the value chains which youth are engaged in is hot culture. Although the motive is business, it can be an opportunity to increase availability of fruits and vegetables in the market, as well as the youth themselves becoming consumers of the fruits. Furthermore, we strongly need to engage in the social behavior changing communication as some of our communities see fruits and vegetables as foods for certain groups in the society. And much worse is when some people think fruits and vegetables are eaten by the low cadre people only. As most of countries now are facing serious problems of double burden malnutrition, or maybe even triple burden, meaning the undernutrition, overnutrition, and micronutrients malnutrition, consuming more of fruits and vegetables can really help killing the three bears with one stone. That's why we need serious partnership to promote this area. <clears throat> I understand our agriculture policies are taking hot catch as one of the strategic value chain to be developed both as business and improving nutrition. We need to partner together to support these initiatives. Other local organizations are also trying to reach communities in various areas of our country. They need also to be supported. 
Dear friends, with the above in mind, my history with the nutrition and my current occupation as a small farmer, I decided it was time to join the efforts of many and contribute towards ending malnutrition in Tanzania through AgriThaman Foundation, an institution which I'm a founding member and chairman of its board. After having carefully analyzed the malnutrition landscape, we decided to find areas in which we can add value the most. Thus, I selected Kagera region as our head office because it is the region with the highest actual number of stunted children in the country, 220,000 in number plus. We are currently operating in 188 public primary schools, 94 public secondary schools, 94 public health centers, and 94 ward level communities across all eight districts in Kagera. And some services which we are providing include the following. One, nutrition education and counseling to school aged children, including adolescents aged 10 to 19 years old, expecting and lactating mothers, with children between the age of six to 24 months. Secondly, nutrition cooking demonstrations for mothers with children between the age of six to 24 months because we found out that this is where malnutrition kicks in since babies are fed mashed adult food. Third, nutrition education and counseling and promoting dietary varieties by including fruits and vegetables to street food vendors. Four, promoting importance of fruits and vegetables, thus improving dietary variety through school fruits and vegetable gardens, community fruits and vegetable demo gardens, and household fruits and vegetable gardens. We currently have two schools vegetable gardens and 15 household gardens started by our adolescents from one of our schools. And five, nutrition cooking demonstrations in villages whereby spot growth measurements are taken. In one village, out of 120 children under five, we, which we examined, we found 60 with the moderate acute malnutrition and 20 with the severe acute malnutrition, or simply some. These 20 some cases were reported to the district nutrition officer immediately, and they were able to save their lives as they would have otherwise unfortunately perished just because of that. Dear friends, Alongside this, AgriThaman Foundation has successfully positioned itself at the forefront of strategic policy and advocacy that aims to ensure that nutrition becomes a national agenda and a prioritized agenda in all key stakeholder groups. Our policy and advocacy work, therefore, involves working very closely with the political parties, religious leaders, media houses, members of parliament, and local government authorities. In Tanzania, we are already working very close with the UNICEF Tanzania, and it is our hope that we'll be able to enter into partnership with many of you here in Washington, DC, particularly in the areas of technical and financial support. We have a number of exciting activities planned for next year, 2020, of which we can further explore and receive your guidance on the same. I understand we have a distance to, tra to cover for us to malnutrition, a history in Tanzania. Sorry. We have a long, a long journey before we probably deal squarely with malnutrition in Tanzania, Africa, as well as the world in general. That journey can be shortened in my opinion, depending on the route we take and the means of reaching. I'm seeing working together in planning, implementing and monitoring cost-effective plans that will include putting in place best strategies of fruits and vegetable gardening in our plans as a way to go. The bad news is that all the countries in the world are faced with some forms of malnutrition. Some countries are battling with the undernutrition, while others a battling over nutrition, and others with both. The good news is we can learn from each other on the best ways to sustainably address all these forms. This is why I'm calling for real value adding and honest partnership here today. 
Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, let me in conclusion, once again, thank the management of the Center for Strategic and International Studies on behalf of the Global Food Security Project for inviting me to share some insights on this very, very important subject. And to you all, invited guests, for your very kind attention. I want to say thank you so much for your attention, and may God bless all of you. Thanks. words. You know, you, you say you're not a nutrition expert, but I tell you, you don't see a lot of former prime ministers up there talking about the triple burden of malnutrition or the multi-sectoral strategies, and, and you really do get it, and you have for a long time. I, my first question to you is, was there a moment when you became a nutrition champion? Or was there something that compelled you to be such a leader on this? Do you remember? It's been a long time. You've been at this, but long before 2011, what was it that compelled and convinced you that this was so important for your country? Okay. Just as I said when I was trying to give you a short story about my background, partly I think it's because I come from you know, a rural setting, born in the rural setting. Mm -hmm. okay? And every time I get time to go back to visit my parents, but in the course of that, you also get to mix it, you know, yourself with the people in the villages. But apart from that, of course, when I was in the ministry relating to regional administration and local government, it's, it's a, 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 a ministry that deals entirely with the rural development. Mm -hmm. So I had ample time to go around, have a feel of how people live, but more significantly, see the kind of challenges you know, that were touching on the population generally. And therefore, one thing that I discovered that we still lacked and we still had to do a lot of work was how to give attention to children generally. Mm. Now, when you pick up that idea, then that's when I started trying to find out, but wha wha what is the problem? Wha what is the cause for these children suffering, you know, anemia and other diseases that could probably be easily controlled? Only to learn that it's all a matter of the type of food that these children get. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is why when I completed my term, I did a little bit when I was still in, in, in the, as a prime minister, but I opened up now my mind after retirement. Uh -huh. So this is why I said, well, let me see if I can make a contribution, smallest maybe, but in this particular area of nutrition. Because all that I've learned or discovered is that what we need actually is to work together with members in the community who are already versed with this particular problem. Secondly, is for we in, the, in our own country, first to own the challenge hold it closely as our dear challenge, mm -hmm. right from the top president and his team and the rest of the other members in the country, then we should find ways on how to tackle this problem. And with Agri Thamani, I'm convinced because we've tried to do something. Mm -hmm. And I, I discovered that it can be done. All that we need now is probably putting up, you know, mechanisms on how we can close work with each other so that we learn more then see what best needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the time that you've been looking at this, um, has your opinions changed on anything related to nutrition, or have you seen things differently than they were, say, a decade ago? Anything, um, any trends you've been watching or things that are different, whether it's related to obesity or youth or? Well, yes, things have changed, I have to, I have to, I have to admit, but the change is the result of so many factors, mm. okay? But I still remember because <laughs> when I was still a bit, you know, 
not very young, but I had already grown up a little bit. It was normal when you go back to the village, you see to hear you know, people crying left, right, up and down. Why? Because they've lost one kid, the other kid died the other day. So, but nowadays, you go to the village, you don't get these frequent, frequent you know, incidences mm. where children are dying. To the contrary, I hear more about old people now dying. Mm. But I think that's the result also because of the programs that the government came in with by way of interventions, building hospital facilities almost at every stage from the village level, we have the world level in our country, the district level, region, and then the nation. Mm -hmm. So currently at least you see that kids, you know, don't lose their lives easily because there is that kind of service all around. But secondly, I think it's also due to the efforts that the government and other key donors have put together on trying to see how nutrition can play the role. Mm -hmm. And this is why you see, that's why I said in my little speech, what we gather in Kagera is what we are seeing taking place in many other parts also of Tanzania. So the change is there, and you can see it vividly, and uh, all that we need now is scaling up that kind of, you know, of, of mm -hmm. result into a much bigger result so that we, we get away from the 31% even to a much lesser number. Uh -huh. Yeah. Speaking of the 31%, you're mm. talking about stunting. Exactly. Um, it is impressive, the numbers, I mean, how, how you've had this, uh, you know, decrease in, the, in percentage of the children that are stunted. If you had to give some advice to another leader of another country that's similar, what advice would you give to him or her on how they could reduce stunting? What worked in Tanzania? I mean, yes, it's governance, it's political will, it's strategies, it's funding, it's partnerships, it's all those things. But what's the best advice you would give to another leader who wants to follow in Tanzania's footsteps? Mm. <laughs> well, it would depend, of course, on the kind of a leader that I'll be talking to. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think I, I would be inclined to go to my African leaders because we mm -hmm. have seen that to resemble. Sure. Okay. Uh, the, the one thing that uh, we, we, we have discovered as a tool, uh, there are many, way, of course, tools, but Working together, for instance, with the political leaders, mm. religious groups, the media, and then taking advantage of some of the situations within each local country, such as the use of cultural groups, for instance, mm. <coughs> singers, dancers, and things like that, as a way of communicating or trying to explain this problem to the communities in a much more easier language that they can understand. Yeah. We have used that very effectively back home. Mm -hmm. See, and this one I'm saying, that probably that would be one thing that I would have advised whoever would be interested in trying to find out how we made it, okay? But secondly, when we came up with a strategy that involves all the ministries in confronting malnutrition, mm. the multisectoral, it has proved it to be very effective. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, nutrition, is a cross-cutting issue. There's no sector that can stay away and say, I'm not involved. Mm -hmm. I'm not needed in this particular group. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said it's very, very significant that you take all the sectors together. Let everybody be involved. Everybody have a, pl a part to play in combating malnutrition. Mm -hmm. But the last thing that I would also say, uh, it's very, very important. What we did in Tanzania, we created this coordinating committee and placed it under the prime minister office. So currently the prime minister is the coordinator of malnutrition in the country. Mm -hmm. So as a head of the government businesses, then he commands everybody, the minister, oh. the deputy, the permanent secretary. So and you can see everything is moving. People are busy being, you know, ask what has happened to this one. So yeah. that creates a little bit of some top down, you know, reflection on how we can deal with malnutrition. Uh -huh. So it has worked fairly well, but of course, it will also depend on each situation of each country. Sure. But generally speaking, those we few things that I would gather for him. When you think about nutrition, um, how do you think about it in connection to a nation's economy or political stability or future <coughs> labor force or even private sector engagement? 
Does nutrition matter? Does it relate to those things at all? And if so, how? Oh, of course, it matters quite a lot, mm -hmm. madam. You know why? <laughs> you you take, take, for instance, when you have a kid, a child, losing life just because she developed anemia. Anemia, when you try and find out what caused it, you won't miss going back to mm -hmm. nutrition. Okay? So, we'll be saving the government's budget in a much more effective way if we can control uh, malnutrition. Because you'll save lives, and in so doing, you'll not be involved again in spending money to try and cure some of these problems that mm. engulf m most of our communities. So it has a, a, a strong economic um, you know, benefit. But apart from that, of course, take Tanzania, for instance. We have decided that by 2025, we want Tanzania to be an, a middle-income country. Okay? Now, if you cannot develop a healthy um, <coughs> community, mm -hmm. then how are they going to take part in this particular right. you know, industrialization process? Mm -hmm. So developing the human resource simply also requires seriously a healthy program for the personnel. Mm -hmm. And this is why we are saying, yes, we are moving towards that direction, but simultaneously we have to deal with malnutrition so that whoever comes into it is a healthy young kid, intellectually strong, you see? Because sometimes people say, well, it's, it's, it's difficult to understand, but when you go into the readings, and that's when you say, oh my God. So sometimes people don't seem to, 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 to have intelligence sufficiently to, to, to understand anything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you tend to look for reasons. But reasons? Typical one good reason is this kid missed the nutrients, maybe right from the mommy's tummy, delivery time, mm -hmm. and even after that. Mm -hmm. So how do you expect him to, to, to have good brains? Yeah. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. So it's important, very, very important that we, 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 we take this matter seriously because I'm sure by so doing, not only will you have a good, healthy future for your country, but you also have strong, intelligent young people mm -hmm. you know, who will be able to, to, to deal with all other issues relating to problems of your country. Yeah. So it's very important. Yeah. You know. I'd like to turn to the CSIS report. I'd like to hear if you have any specific feedback or thoughts on it, or I'd like to, to hear if there's recommendations that you thought were missing or that you would have included. You know, if <coughs> you were talking, or you probably do in your current role with the foundation, how do you think fruits and vegetables, you know, could be consumed more in your country? What policy recommendations should have been our, our report or you would have put in our report? Well, I've, I've not gone through the whole report. But it's at a least long I had, one. It's okay. <laughs> but at least I've had a bit of, of what it contains. And, yeah. uh, but but what one thing that I, I, I've loved so much about the report is the emphasis on adolescence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because to me, I, I'm taking this matter very seriously. Mm -hmm. Because I know if I manage and the government manages to deal with this area squarely, I'm seeing a brighter future because mm -hmm. I'll be having mothers who are already well founded with malnutrition issues. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we are going to create a better you know, nation as we go along. But uh, coming now to the, to the, to the question, as, you, as I, have a point, I try to point out, there is an increase in the vegetable and fruit production mm -hmm. in our country. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And even if, when you go now into the streets, you, you see a lot of vendors selling fruits mm -hmm. and, and whatnot, almost everywhere. Mm. And I can even give you a good case of the Doma where I come from. It used to, the, to reach a time when you, you go to the market, you cannot buy a fruit because there's no fruit. Mm. See? But now, oh my God, <laughs> it, it, you go everywhere. And even the streets now, they're scattered with the fruits everywhere. Mm -hmm. The only part that I, I agree with your report <coughs> is the fact that Tanzania, the greater percentage, particularly in the rural setting and whatnot, and for the urban people as well, mm -hmm. he may be selling a number of fruits, but he doesn't see the need to eat the fruit. Mm. For him, he's just looking for money. Yeah. He forgets that, well, if you eat that fruit, you'll also reduce the need for money to go to hospital. Yeah. You see? He doesn't see that. 
So the report tries to point out this particular direction. I said, yes, I think you are right on this one. We have to undergo a serious mindset changing, okay? Mm -hmm. So that people now, that we are capable of producing vegetables, now we should go into a bigger step of using those vegetables for our own uh -huh. health. Uh -huh. And this is why, and with Agri Samani, we thought the best way is to start using the children at school level, uh -huh. exposing them to eating fruits, because thereafter there will be people demanding for yeah. fruits. And in the course of time, maybe we can now reach a stage where uh -huh. everybody thinks eating fruit is important. And uh, probably, in my case, um, I'm doing, uh, of course I'm doing some agriculture, mm -hmm. but what type of agriculture is probably significant? I've got some few acres, about 30 acres, which I've done mango plantations, mm -hmm. okay? I've got grapevines also, about 10 acres, right? But what is more important to me is the vegetables mm. group. Mm -hmm. Madam, you'll be surprised. That's what I'm saying, something that very encouraging. I produce vegetables in my little farm. And the biggest people who come in big numbers to buy the vegetables, mm -hmm. ladies, mm. mamas. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so nice. So sometimes I go now to the, to the city to see what these mamas are doing. <clears throat> But all that I see is they're very busy selling vegetables. So sometimes I ask, do you eat vegetables? So they say, ah, no, we are selling vegetables. <laughs> now, you see, you see the, the <coughs> it's something that seriously, I said, I think we need now to educate them yeah. more effectively. Yeah. And with Agri Thaman, we've already set up our ways of the, what would be the best way mm -hmm. to tackle that problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've I mean, taken it up also, because I've already started, the, I've actually, I've had so far, about two, three conferences mm. relating to ladies. Mm -hmm. And my story is nothing else. Apart from other things that I was called to do, I would always end up with malnutrition. Mm. So it, it's, it's nice, and I think it's possible. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I like your point, <coughs> but the report focuses a lot on behavior change, because yeah. that's ultimately what it comes down to. And you definitely have to start early with education and behavior change. Just to end, talking about your farm and talking about vegetables, what's your favorite vegetable? <laughs> Oh, that's a very good question, you know. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Because we have, <laughs> we have vegetables which are, uh, what I would say, local. Yes. Local pro products. Mm -hmm. Which you don't find maybe in Europe or in America or in other parts. Okay? Mm -hmm. Of course, when I come to see you, then I've, I'm forced to eat the vegetables I see on the table. Mm. And sometimes I say, they're not even sweet, they're not even, they don't taste nicely, but <laughs> that's it. <laughs> now, I don't know, Mchicho na Swahili. Oh, Amaranth, yeah. You know that, right? I do know that, yeah. yeah that's Amaranth. my favorite. I learned it in Tanzania, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and normally, <clears throat> yeah. I like when it's cooked together with the granites, mm -hmm. nuts. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, like a be. leafy green. Yeah. 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 That, that's my very, very, very favorable. And when right. you come there, you, you find that one almost one acre completely is nothing but that one. Of course, for selling, but also for yeah. consumption. So when we come, you can cook us your Why favorite amaranth dish. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us. Can Thank you. Give him a round Thank of you. applause. <laughs> We will now have our panel led by Dr. Amy Boudreau, and we'll have some switching of chairs. So just give us a minute as we get our stage ready. Hold on one okay. minute. Thank you. Asante sana. Yes, asante sana. <laughs> <coughs>
of fruits and vegetables. <laughs> um, this panel, this great panel that we have here today, um, is really going to focus on the recommendations in the report. And yes, the report is long, so I suggest that you definitely check out the the interactive story that was released today on the CSIS website. It's got some cool interactives, some great photography, and it's a much more condensed uh, story version that focuses on some of the, the change makers we met while in Tanzania. So for the panel, we're going to focus on four recommendations, which are creating consumer demand, which Honorable Pina definitely discussed as well, so it's a nice segue, broadening implementation, scaling up the multi-sectoral approach, and then also accelerating private public engagement. To my right, I have Dr. Sally Abbott, who is the Acting Division Chief for the Bureau of Food Security at USAID. In the middle is Dr. Ralph Ruthard, who is the flagship lead for Healthy Diets, Eastern and Southern Africa at the World Vegetable Center, who traveled all the way from Tanzania to be here with us today. And then lastly is um, Dr. Habtamu Fakadu, who is the Senior Director of Save the Children. So, um, like I said, it's, it's really excellent that we have such a, di a diverse group of experts who are very knowledgeable about nutrition and then also fruits and vegetables. So to, f to kick off the first question on creating consumer demand, and this is really the behavior change piece. Um, in the field, we learned that the biggest barrier, the consensus among everyone we talk to, and we talked to about 150 people uh, in DC, across the United States, other countries, and in Tanzania, that the biggest barrier is that it's, there's a lack of knowledge, the lack of knowledge of what malnutrition actually is, um, but also what fruits and vegetables, what nutrients they provide, and how they aid in optimal health. Um, this, this lack of knowledge is also followed by misinformation that is passed down through generations, and there's also an incredible fear of pesticides. And something I learned that was super interesting was a lot of Tanzanians don't eat raw vegetables, and that's because of the fear of pesticides. So this, this lack of knowledge spanned multiple areas. Um, but then, as we've noticed in high-income countries uh, and globally, fruit and vegetable consumption is extremely low, um, no matter where you go. And if we even educate people, and take the United States for example, no matter how much we educate people on the importance of nutrition and the nutrients fruits and vegetables provide, we're still not consuming enough. So this is the first question. How do we create demand? And I call this the triple or the, the trillion dollar question because it really is such a, a complex issue. And, and how do we get people to eat more fruits and vegetables and also just nutrient dense food in general? So I'm gonna turn this over to Sally first. Um, and this is a question for all the panelists because uh, I think it's a, one of the major questions today. Okay, thanks. So I think, um, first of all, I think we wanna acknowledge that price still is an mm -hmm. issue. That um, when you're talking about the base of the pyramid, the price, those living on less than $2 a day, the price of fruits and vegetables can still be a barrier or even a perceived barrier to what they're purchasing, what they're buying, or the decision to sell fruits and vegetables as opposed to consuming what they're, what they're um, doing themselves. That we, we as donors, those of us sitting behind desks in Washington, often expect that we're gonna be increasing supply, increasing demand, and um, having that happen at the exact same moment so that there's no issues with people being able to purchase something in the market or being able to have that supply get to the market um, at the same time. And that we want that not just for the base of the pyramid, but also those middle and consumers um, who are still often poor, still maybe just over that $2 of the day. We want all of that to happen for everybody at the same time. And that might be a little bit much to be asking something to be done. Um, that's, that's something I think we should be considering. We also have to understand that the factors that go into what make nutritious foods desirable, aspirational, and convenient are parts that what we need to be looking at in demand. I, um, I laughed at the spinach piece because there's sort of a joke in my own household. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old about, oh, what are we having for dinner tonight? Oh, it's going to be spinach because my children will not touch spinach. They just won't touch it. Okay. They will try some other vegetables. Um, you know, they will try broccoli. They'll try other things. And someone once told me that you know, in order to get my kids to eat vegetables, they need to try them nine times. That's right. And that's a lot. And I'm sitting from a position of great privilege where I have a husband who makes most of the food, who knows how to cook most of the food, 
um, and that we can afford to have our three-year-old and five-year-old try all of these different vegetables that we have available in our local grocery store all the time. I can sit on a phone and put an order in and have it show up at my house. And you know that is convenience. That is um, a price point that we can afford. It is still trying to make that desirability. And I think that trying to get all those right in the settings that we work in is something we are all struggling with. I'm not sure I'm answering how yeah. <laughs> so much as putting out that we need to be thinking about all of these different pieces and recognizing that it can't just be on moms to make a change happen by themselves. That when we're talking about behavior change, we need to be empowering those decision makers, the moms, the grandmothers, the, the fathers, to be able to have those foods accessible to them, affordable to them, convenient enough to cook or prepare in a way that's desirable to them. Um, and we need to do that all at the exact same time that we're increasing supply. <laughs> Yes, yes, and I, I had not heard that it takes nine times. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> maybe, maybe there's some vegetables I should try eating more nine times, <laughs> and maybe I'll like them more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ralph, on to you. What are yeah. your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, Sally, you, you touched upon the issue of taste, and that's not an, uh, only an American thing. That's a global thing. And um, particularly in Tanzania, where, uh, where I work and where, I, where we do a lot of research, we find that a lot of the vegetables, uh, the traditional vegetables, they have a, a tardy, bitter taste. Mm -hmm. And lots of adult people love it, you know, they've grown up with it and they really like it. And sometimes the more bitter, the better. However, children all over the world do not like bitter taste of vegetables. So one of the things you can actually do, and what we are doing at World Vegetable Center, is selecting among these species of vegetables that have a bitter taste, select those varieties or those accessions that have less bitterness. And we've managed to do that. For instance, um, African nightshade, there's a huge range of variability. And there are some broadleaf uh, vegetables um, types of African nightshade that are actually sweet and, and, and children mm. love it. Um, but cooking is also an, a, a major uh, determination on acceptability and demand of a vegetable. Um, it, it, tradition, sometimes traditional ways of cooking involve a lot of boiling, uh, throwing away of the water. It's not only a, a pity because you lose the nutrients, it's also what you remain is, is a fibrous a mass of vegetables which are not particularly appealing. Um, we've experimented with uh, increased, uh, um, improved recipes, such as Honorable Pinda mentioned, for instance, if you add some peanuts or peanut butter in chicha in amaranth, it actually tastes much better. But you can also add some milk or some, there are some recipes with uh, onions and, and tomatoes that greatly enhances the um, uh, acceptability. Um, but then you also have the issue of gender. Because if you only work with women, and that's where, what a lot of people do in a lot of organizations, they, say, they think, oh, well, the women are the custodians of food, which is true for most cases. Um, but who determines um, what is going to be cooked in the household? It's not only the woman. If the husband doesn't like the food, um, but she has, uh, um, she has just learned this great new recipe, but the husband doesn't like it, it's not going to go very far. So with cooking demonstrations, for instance, it's incredibly important that you involve the, the men, the husbands, also the children, so that uh, in innovations uh, in terms of taste, palatability, uh, it cuts across different uh, groups. Uh, then finally, I would like to mention um, the convenience factor, mm -hmm. um, because we also see not only here, uh, not only in, in industrialized countries, but in African countries, developing countries, there's a huge migration from rural areas to the cities. And with that migration also comes changed uh, food preferences, fast food. People in urban areas do not have time to cook. Uh, men and women, they're all working, scavenging for jobs. Um, and the, the types of fast foods that are available and the, the food vendors in the street are, are fried foods, high carb, high salt. So if we can introduce vegetables and make them appealing, and there's lots of ways of doing that, we can actually also tap into this huge population in the urban areas that also need better foods and, and, and better tasting vegetables. Mm -hmm. Interesting, and we, we will circle back to the gender dynamic as well later. Habtamil, your thoughts? I think that uh, one nation delivery is one of the projects highlighted in the report. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, 
one of the objective of the project to increase you know one production to consumption of fruits and vegetables as part of you know dietary diversity so what we're uh, doing in tanzania in four provinces is uh, one is we you know to increase you know to increase demand uh, at the community level i think one is there is a lot of lack of knowledge uh, and the skill how to produce it and how to prepare it in a way that can be consumed by children. Mm -hmm. So one, some of the activities that we are doing through our social behavior change, through our extension, you know, through the extension program of the government and through both the health and the agricultural extension workers. So basically what we do is, you know, we transfer the skill how to produce, prepare and consume uh, fruits and vegetables as part of the comprehensive dietary diversity. So, so that's one of the way to you know, increase demand uh, from the community. The other one is, you know, sometimes we think that our agricultural extension workers, they know everything about fruits and vegetables, but it's not true. Mm -hmm. And then how to increase that demand at the community level. So we. Uh, you know, are supporting you know the agricultural extension workers and how they can demonstrate. You know, we, we build their capacity, but at the same time, how they transfer that skill to uh, uh, to communities and household level. The other one, I think, uh, consumption is uh, to increase demand. I, I don't think we have to see only consumption. I think it's, there should be also some market value because you know household is you now. They need money for other expenditures. It's not only for food consumption. So I think fruits and vegetables are probably we can sell the idea. It can generate some income. Usually, that's can be that's going to be controlled by actually by women. Uh, not usually in most African countries, including Tanzania, it's not really controlled by men. It's controlled by women. That will have a lot of impact to increase demand in production and consumption at community level. And that's what we are trying to do with the Tanzanian government through the Leisure and Delivery Project. Mm -hmm. So, as you can see, it's a very, very complex problem. Um, moving on to the next recommendation was uh, really about the implementation. And the research focused on four different projects. Uh, two were from USAID, Feed the Future. One was co-funded by the Netherlands government, and also one was a small local organization that did uh, solely um, volunteers and at the local level grassroots initiative. Um, the projects were similar and different. They focused on cooking demonstrations because in Tanzania um, most people cook vegetables way too long which actually strips the nutrients from them. So cooking demonstrations was one of the implementation methods that was across the board in the projects. Uh, community um, so this, the school, the local primary and secondary school education had nutrition and garden clubs. Uh, we also saw some market-based approaches, so connecting smallholder farmers to um, microfinancing, which is also important <coughs> since fruits and vegetables are extremely risky as an investment. Um, and, uh, and then also we saw from the Liche Endelivu project that Save the Children leads, um, clinic, health clinic classes. Um, focusing on nutrition, and then that also included the cooking demonstration. So Ralph, um, you've done a lot of work with um, school-based programs um, and these nutrition and garden clubs. I've, while I was writing the report, I found some evaluations, and, and the effectiveness is kind of mixed. Um, some of the evaluations, and this is in, in many different countries, some of the evaluations found that uh, knowledge did improve, but then consumption didn't. So I'd like to hear um, your experiences with these school gardens and, and the research that you've done with them. Because it's, it's, a, it's a big, I see it as a, a huge opportunity um, to, to create that behavior change young. Sure, yes, yeah. Yeah, so we, we've worked a lot uh, in both Asia, Southeast Asia and Africa on uh, home garden scaling, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, 
and I believe there's an incredible value in it. And we've also done um, impact assessment to show that there is a huge impact uh, of these kind of interventions. And uh, particularly the, the knowledge aspect that you mentioned, um, because what we do in, in, in these kind of programs, we don't only work on the supply, yeah, increasing the amount of vegetables available for home consumption, we, we equal, put equal amount of effort into increasing the, the demand. And how do you do that? Through increasing knowledge about vegetables. Uh, people have been eating traditional vegetables since time memorial. That's why they're called traditional. But they eat minute amounts of it. And that's the problem. People do not know that you have to have a certain amount, that if you have a lot of starch, you also have to have equal portion of vegetables. Um, what is the difference between macro and micronutrients? Uh, what are vitamins? What are mi um, uh, minerals? How do you uh, how do, do vitamins get destroyed? What are they used for? Why is it imp uh, so bad that um, uh, children have a micronutrient deficiencies? So that is actually um, these programs do um, increase the knowledge and therefore the demand for these vegetables. Um, Secondly, um, we also prove, have proven that um, through these interventions, you actually increase the diversity of uh, vegetables that are grown in the, um, in the gardens for home consumption. And that's important because every vegetable has certain richnesses of micronutrients and they have to complement each other. You should not eat um, the same vegetable every day. Mm -hmm. um, but also the seasonality. Um, during the rainy season, uh, vegetables are actually even growing wild. Right? Uh, but in the dry season, there's a huge shortage of vegetables and the, and the price of vegetables also um, increase. Um, so through these interventions, we've, um, we've seen that we can ex extend the availability of the vegetables for, uh, for consumers into the dry season for more than six weeks. So that's a significant uh, um, uh, achievement. In, in terms of the school um, initiatives, um, the purpose there is not so much to increase the consumption. Uh, obviously, we want that. That's the, the, the indirect benefit. But the direct benefit of these school interventions and school gardens is to create a, to a, a practical knowledge, practical skills, and link that to the theoretical curriculum that, they, uh, that schools teach in biology and health classes. And um, so excite students and get some, make all this theory a little bit more tangible when they can actually dig their hands in the soil. And then also educate their parents. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And even take some of the seeds that we distribute through seed kits, improved seeds, um, f f and which they can uh, reproduce because they're open pollinated varieties. Take those seeds back to the, the, their, uh, their parents, grow them at the home, and even their parents can scale them out uh, to the community. So it's a bottom up um, uh, scaling up of uh, knowledge and practices. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's one, one thing that I noticed there that I was amazed by was that these 10 to 12 year olds actually start and manage their own kitchen gardens at their house. Um, and then the vegetables that they don't eat at home, they actually sell. So they're becoming young entrepreneurs at such an early age and really educating their, their communities about the importance of fruits and vegetables, um, which was amazing to see. Um, shifting to another implementation topic, to Haptabu, uh, Save the Children is the lead partner for this Feed the Future project. And a lot of the work that is done in health clinics. Um, and we actually went to one in Moragoro, Tanzania. And the room was filled with, with uh, I, w I think, about 40 w women. But I did notice that there wasn't one man. <laughs> there was one man, and I actually approached him, and he wasn't there for the nutrition class. <laughs> I targeted him and, and zoomed in. Um, and, and gender is an issue. Um, so I, I'd like to hear from you about how um, this project is, is doing gender empowerment for women, but also what role men play um, in fruit and vegetable consumption and just overall in nutrition and improving malnutrition o overall. Uh, it's a good observation, and I don't think it is uh, special for Tanzania or the mm -hmm. Gender Project. In most you know, uh, African countries, you know, when you go to the health facility, usually women and caretakers are coming to the health facility. Men are going to the agricultural trainings, agricultural demonstrations. 
So that's probably what you know you witnessed uh, during your field visit. But what we are trying to uh, we are trying to do as a project is uh, we did two things. One is we did uh, review existing projects in Tanzania, how they are doing some their gender activities, mm -hmm. and we also did uh, 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 gender analysis uh, that's specific for the four provinces where we operate. Uh, what what the main finding from those assessments is one, most of the nutrition projects, whether this is for nutrition specific or for uh, nutrition sensitive like fruits and vegetables, we tend to target, they tend to target you know, women only. But we know, uh, and from the, that assessment also, they found out that uh, uh, in the Women Empowerment Index for Agriculture, uh, out of the seven, five of them are really uh, uh, were important in those contexts. One is a production phase in terms of empowerment. Men has a strong, a huge role in production, uh, in deciding you know what to plant in uh, in the land. At the same time, you know, controlling the, uh, making the decision about purchasing and other stuff. So because of all these assessments, so what we are doing is now is we. Uh, we, are, we introduced two approaches under Lishen Deliver. One is, is men are part of our, uh, we have a, a community conversation program to change, you know, uh, the bigger challenge in terms of an, a community society level. We have a community conversation. And the previous project involved only women and, you know, or grandmothers, but now this project uh, consider, you know, one of the group are men. So basically, is men is you know how well, we focus on three areas. One is you know joint decision making in terms of household resource. Two is and it, what we found out also is uh, couple communication or communication within a household is a big uh, barrier for uh, you know gender balance in, in the household level. So couple communication is one of the component in that parent kids uh, community conversation. And the other thing we are doing is we have, you know, we are implementing a male championship program so that we identify model men in the community so that, you know, they can transfer that kind of skill and influence other men so that, you know, they involve in, in nutrition activities, but at the same time improving, uh, empowering women uh, and the other thing is they will see also peer educators. So we train them and also they train their peers. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, so that's what we are doing in terms of social behavior change. But at the same time, health facilities. So one of the discussion they, the, they do is how men can sub go to the health services together with, uh, with their wife or to take care of kids also. So in some of the facilities now, they, we are seeing that it's some improvement uh, in terms of you know men engaged in the uh, taking care of their kids or taking care of their wives when they go go for health services. But still, it's a big challenge that mm -hmm. we have to work on. Mm -hmm. And there is there there are a lot of boys in the nutrition and garden clubs in the schools too. More fe more girls, but there are there are boys in the classes as well. Um, so, um, moving on to the the multi-sectoral approach. So this is. Um, as, as Sally can talk about a little bit. This is a, a big initiative that USAID is doing um, to, to integrate the many sectors that affect nutrition. Um, I, I challenge you to think of a sector that doesn't affect nutrition, <laughs> if you wanna um, ask that during the Q&A. But um, Tanzania is also has a multi-sectoral approach too. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about how USAID is supporting Tanzania in, in achieving its multi-sectoral goals, um, and, and as well as its own. So I think that one of the things to talk about first is that USAID, along with a number of other partners and donors and the government, um, supported the government of Tanzania to develop the national, oh, I get this right, the Tanzania National Multisectoral Nutrition Action Plan. Yes. Um, and now our programming is aligned with that plan. And this, I think, speaks to the overall desire that USAID has to really put um, countries in the driver's seat of their own development overall, not just for nutrition. That um, commitment and capacity and 
um, resource mobilization are really underpinning a lot of our work. And it's, it's very heartening to hear about how Tanzania has really been at the front of this, of actually identifying resources from their own budgets to help with um, implementing programs, implementing activities. And this, I think, speaks to what we're trying to support. Additionally, you know, we're focusing on improving nutrition through integrated health and agriculture programs and services in both district and community levels, strengthening institutions and civil society organizations, scaling up social behavior change, and um, aligning efforts around the enabling environment for nutrition. And I love, you know, we, we talk about the enabling environment and what this means. But so the civil society, the actions, the policies, um, we also recognize that when we're talking about integrated programming, we don't integrate just for the sake of integrating. It has to be really think about and coordinated about what we're doing and why. And why are we working in fruits and vegetables and why are we supporting value chains and how does that and does that not um, at times make sense to have everything exactly the same or coordinated exactly the same. That you know, we, we've learned a lot about sort of this nutrition sensitive agriculture piece and we recognize that now we really need to be working across the entire food system, not just about production, not just about um, sort of the household level, but all sorts of different actors across markets. And what are the opportunities that we have for youth to be um, employed and really excited about the opportunities in agriculture that aren't just the production pieces, but across the the value chain, and I think that's a shift that we've been making, and, and Tanzania is a great example of how they've been at the forefront of really increasing that capacity and commitment. Sure, yes. Um, Haptimo, the, the Save the Children project, actually, that's one of the goals, is to support Tanzania with its multi-sectoral approach. So um, what, what's the project doing specifically, and, and have, have you seen any challenges or opportunities with, with working with the Tanzanian government and supporting them? Uh, I think I, I think we have to comment, you know, the Tanzanian government and the development partners in Tanzania because there is a, there are several opportunities for multi-sectoral coordination at different level. One is the you know, multi-sectoral plan of action, and there is a clear structure in terms of reference for establishing multi-sectoral coordination at different level from the national up to the council level and also at local government level. So Alicia and Delebu is mainly, it's a project, it's a community-based project. So our support is at local government uh, level. So how to improve, you know, even if you know there is a plan of action, the terms of reference and the coordination, there is a good nutrition scorecard in Tanzania. And also there is a commitment budget for each council for nutrition. But the main challenge is most of this multi-sectoral coordination are not really functional. And they are not really using the tools that are already in the national plan of action. So, Alicia and Delebu, what we are trying to do, we are supporting this um, multi-sectoral coordination at the council level. One is we provide training for them how they can, uh, you know, use the scorecard, how they can engage in the planning process at council level because there is a uh, a tool that's you know a tool for uh, developed by the government to allocate resources at the council level. But how can we use that tool so that, you know, they use that tool to convince the planning and the, the ones who are deciding on budget to budget for nutrition. Uh, and we also help them to do some kind of analysis for their council. So last year, you know, uh, in, 20, in 2018, we supported 22 multi-sectoral coordination councils at the uh, in, uh, local government level. Out of the 20 to 14 of them now, they have established a functional multi-sectoral coordination bodies. Out of um, those around 10, 10 of them, they allocated budget for it, which is the minimum amount of budget, which is 1,000 ton, 1, Tanzanian shilling. Each purchase should be allocated in the council budget. So out of the 22, around 10 of them allocated that budget using all this capacity building we implemented. The other one is a major challenge is involving private sector uh, in the local, in private sector engagement is better at higher level, but not at the local level. So we did mapping of the existing private sector at local government level. And this year what we are going to do is how we work with the local government to uh, involve you know, private sector as part of the multi-sectoral coordination committee. But, you know, 
I manage, you know, several USAID, my big multi-sectoral project, but this is the most daunting and challenging <laughs> task. Uh, you can do it as a project, but unless it's really owned by the local government, unless the government's putting budget, any project cannot sustain multi-sectoral coordination in any country, in any place. Yes, yes, definitely agree with that. Um, so the last recommendation focused on public-private engagement, uh, looking at um, how, how we engage the private sector, because the private sector is a major player uh, in nutrition and agriculture, um, and oftentimes they are left out of conversations uh, and not included in projects. Um, seed companies and, and microfinancing lenders were two of the predominant uh, industry companies that were across all of the projects that in somehow partnered with, with the projects being implemented. Um, and the Dutch government project actually was co-funded by the private sector and, and by in-kind contributions as well from, from partnering institutions. Um, I'll start off with Ralph. Um, the World Vegetable Center partners with industry and mo with multiple foreign aid projects. Why is working with seed companies necessary? Um, and then also, what are the opportunities and challenges um, with working with the private sector, specifically seed companies, and then how does foreign aid fit into this, these complex relationships? Right. Oh, thanks for that question. Um, yes, uh, we work a lot with uh, private seed companies. Um, uh, for example, in the USAID-funded uh, project on home garden scaling that finished, um, we had an element of um, seed kits, which we distributed to um, more than 40,000 households in five countries. Uh, but that is just thousands of households. What we really want, our aim really is to reach millions of farmers, millions of households, and not only in Tanzania, also in other countries. And we cannot do that. Our, um, we, uh, our research and development organization with limited staff, and so we, it, it, it just doesn't make sense not to work with the private seed companies whose business it is to um, disseminate all these good, excellent varieties uh, to, um, uh, to so many households. So, so we have started doing that. And uh, they, are, they have taken over to some extent the, the production and distribution of these uh, seed kits. Um, so, at, to that point, it uh, sounds wonderful, right? You know, transfer this responsibility to, to the private sector and they run with it. Um, yes and no. Yes, it, got, um, it's, 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 it, it is being commercialized, um, but the quality aspect is what you have to be very um, um, concerned about. What we see is that sometimes um, the, 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 the varieties that are printed on the packages and displayed with a photograph is not actually what is inside the, inside the seed package. Or that um, the germination percentage of the seeds that uh, ultimately the, the households and the farmers get um, is uh, just a few percent, where it is supposed to be 85 or 90%. So we still have a, a, a monitoring role to play, and I think that's where partnership comes in, and that's where um, you need some kind of public funds to con continue to uh, stimulate that commercialization, and I, I call it subsidies. Yeah? In the beginning, uh, it's mon it, it is managed by organizations such as World Veg or other NGOs, and gradually you shift away and privatize and commercialize that. Um, the other thing is that in order to, for something to become attractive to the private sector, you need to have an element of scale. Um, and, but the, it's a chicken and an egg situation. You can't just start with scale, you know. You have to build that up. And again, you need some kind of foreign investments to create that scale so that then it becomes a, uh, attractive for uh, seed companies. For instance, seed companies tell us if you have uh, more than 50,000 clients in, in one country, uh, then we'll take over this production of these seed kits. Or if we can uh, bring the price down to one or two dollars uh, per kit, then it will be interesting. But so it's all in terms of uh, a matter of economies of scale. Um, the, 
I also want to give you an example of a, a, a success that uh, uh, we are cultivating and uh, which comes from a success in Southeast Asia with a consortium where we um, bring seed companies together. Um, they, we bring them together and um, there's a little bit of contribution from the private sector towards us and that's helpful because we pour a lot of money into very extensive, uh, very expensive and incredibly essential services such as germplasm or seed uh, um, conservation. Um, we have huge facilities that need to be funded. But more than getting the money from these members of these um, uh, the seed co uh, consortia is that we get um, information about what happens to all those seeds that we disseminate through the private uh, companies, where do they go? Which seed varieties are, um, um, are, are being taken up? Or which seed lines, parent lines, are the seed companies using to make hybrids and, and, and are successful and create an impact? Because we need those data for, on, on impact. We are obliged to uh, give that back to our donors, to the individual, to the taxpayers, to show that actually what you're investing in is actually useful. And obviously, we need to do more of that. So we are in constant need of uh, 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 more funding, more investment, so that we can continue to breed those excellent varieties. Sure, yes. Impacts is always an important issue, and we could do an entirely separate panel on that <laughs> topic. Um, Sally. I may, uh, <laughs> I may add, oh, yeah. you know, when we talk about private sector, for especially for fruits and vegetables, we always talk about seed. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is because fruits are seasonal, it's perishable. I think the private sector they have a role on, you know, extending the shelf life of those products because this is important for rural communities. So I think that's another area probably I didn't see in this report. Is they really have a role because here I can get dried. Uh, you know, mango, like in a small package. Mm -hmm. because, but the, you know, having those kind of things can be done only by a private sector. It's very difficult to do it through the government. That's another area for of engagement for private sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also the, the role of small and medium enterprises in Tanzania yeah. is, is critical as well. Um, Sally, the uh, USAID came out with the private sector engagement policy, I believe, last year. Um, how do you see that affecting nutrition partnerships in the future? Yeah, so I am um, very excited about the private sector engagement policy. And um, since it's launched almost a year ago, we're, we've been looking at sort of this bureau um, sort of implementation plans and how are we all going to be implementing and looking at this, this engagement policy. Um, and it's really allowed us an opportunity to think about how we can be more strategic and forward-leaning rather than reactive. And looking how, what are the opportunities for private sector engagement and where, what is our role as USAID? I think in the nutrition community, we often shy away from engaging with the private sector. We remember things that happened 15, 20 years ago rather than looking at what's happening now. And we need to stop that. We need to be um, equal partners with the private sector. We need to be proactive partners with the private sector. We need to um, look at the private sector as a whole, um, but also recognizing that there's very different actors and players, and how we engage can't be a one-size-fits-all approach. You know, we at USAID, we work with these large multinational corporations, but we also are working with small and medium enterprises. And one of the things that we've found with the small and medium enterprises is that finance is really a constraining factor. And we're not a development bank. There is a, you know, we have a development bank from the US government. So our role at USAID is often more to be sort of a convener and a technical assistance and to provide those links of having people that can talk to the banks, talk to the finance, but also understand the, the niche parts of nutrition and what is a nutrition, but also what isn't different. Because we often like to reinvent and say the same thing and you know, talk about, oh, well, this problem, this problem. And you know, the, the idea that people need better business plans that's a universal thing that's not specific to a nutrition issue. So how do we rely on those that know how to do that and bring those people into the conversation? And how do we bring the finance folks into the conversation and explain why the nutrition is a little bit different and why there might be more risk and how can we work with them to offset that? And I think that that's, that's sort of some of the pieces of how we're trying to think strategically about our work going forward instead of just reacting what has come to us. Sure. Thank you. So the last question, we have limited time, so I'm going to uh, do it at a, a rapid pace, kind of, 
I don't know, speed dating kind of style. <laughs> um, if you had to put out of the four recommendations on creating demand, implementation, multi-sectoral approach, and then uh, public-private engagement, if you could only choose one and you had to put all your re resources into one of those recommendations, which, which would it be and, and why in one sentence? <laughs> Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to say anything. Um, we're all academics, so it's hard to say anything in one sentence. <laughs> uh, have to move oh, it like start? A, <laughs> Put you on the spot. tough question already, one second. <laughs> Timer started. <laughs> I, I would say, you know, to, from a community perspective, in great demand, I prioritize that one. Okay. Incredibly tough. Supply and demand needs to come together, but if I have to choose, I would tell uh, it's uh, increasing demand through public-private partnership. Okay. Combined, <laughs> hybrid, I like that. Yeah. You address the supply already. Very creative. <laughs> so I'm actually so. not going to answer that because I think one of the benefits about working at USAID is that we don't have to just do one, yes, and sure. we actually have the responsibility to, do, to enable and empower others to do all of those, yes. and um, that you have to create demand you have to have public-private sector engagement, and you have to work across sectors, and we have to put countries in their own driver's seat in making the change. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we're gonna turn it over to the audience. Um, Honorable Pina would like to um, start the Q&A with some comments, so if you wanna bring the microphone up to him. Would you like to come up here, or you can stand? Please stand. Okay. Do you, you know comments? Do you, do you want to provide any feedback or comments on the panel? Okay. <clears throat> you can, if you could, please stand for the um, online audience. Oh no, there, the camera's back there. Hello, everyone. Um, yes. <laughs> Whatever you're more comfortable with. Well, let me just say very briefly that first, thank you so much because I've been listening to some of the answers from your questions. And uh, <clears throat> to me, as a person from Tanzania, I think it just cemented some of the views and observations that I've noted in the report. So I simply want to say thank you very much. Um, but one area which back home is hot and something that we should keep on fighting is what we call mm, male chauvinism. It's something to do with, it's partly it's cultural, but I think it has been exaggerated. You know, in most families, I'm not sure about the whole of Africa, but in Tanzania, a man determines what to eat and how to, to go about life generally. Now, when it comes to malnutrition issues, if dad in the home thinks eating vegetables is for poor people, then we won't eat vegetables. If he wants meat to be eaten in the family, then it will be eaten, nothing else. Now, that kind of attitude hampers a lot of these initiatives towards fighting malnutrition. So I think in the course of time, thanks for some of the observations here, but I thought I should comment a little bit on this one, mm -hmm. because yeah. to me, I'm taking back something that I've earned from the report, but also generally from some comments. We have to fight against this. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll not make a big step forward. And I'm saying this because when you have a country where poverty, ignorance, and diseases are still rampant, that's why you find this problem even more exaggerated, because man is everything. Okay? But thanks now, at least our education has picked up quite nicely in our country. We hope uh, these kind of husbands will soon find their way to God and then leave young guys now who are easy to handle and to understand, and I think we should be able to achieve something. But otherwise, madam, thank you so much. I don't want to take okay, much of, you. yeah, thank you. Just, thank you just that I think it's enough. Yes. Asante san. Asante, asante. <laughs> um, next to the audience, we'll, we'll do this in rounds of three. Um, so let's start with the woman on the aisle right there um, and give the, uh, the we, have, we have enough time that I'm sure we'll, we'll get to everyone's questions. So. 
Please Great. stand up, state your name, your organization, and a brief question. Limit Great. one to two sentences, please. Thank you so much to the panelists and to the Honorable Prime Minister for all of your um, excellent insights. My name is Carrie Dobies. I'm a senior uh, program officer at IMA World Health just around the corner. I support all of our Tanzania health programs, including the DFID-funded Astute Stunting Reduction Program. Um, so my question is specifically for the Prime Minister, but um, perhaps our colleague from Save the Children can also help address this. Um, with the 1,000 T shillings per child that is allocated, I wondered if um, you could speak specifically as to how that gets allocated and how, how you ensure that it's actually distributed and spent specifically um, on nutrition activities. And also wondered if that comes from the central level or if that comes from the either regional or district level. Okay, um, let's go to Julie right there, with the, right next to the microphone. Hi, uh, Julie Howard, CSIS Senior Advisor here. Amy, thanks for a very good report Thank and you. the panel for an excellent discussion. I wonder um, about the urgency that we attach to this issue and how we think about how much we're investing in fruits and vegetables compared to the rest of, of agriculture. So, you know, I think since Green Revolution days, we've had very heavily weighted investments on cereals and that's now sort of manifesting as pretty serious health health issues right now. So I know that's not something that was explicitly covered in the report, but I'm just wondering in the, the comments of, of, of the Prime Minister and also the panelists on what is what should the, the weight be and how might we get that level of investment out? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so front row, second row over here. Don't worry, you're next, <laughs> next round. I'm Dana, oh, thank you very much. I, I'm Dana Weckeser, Global Health Partnerships Consulting. Um, I would love to say a lot, but I'm gonna limit myself to one question, and it mainly goes to Ralph, but maybe also to the Prime Minister. Um, one thing about fruits and vegetables, it depends also on the nutrients in the ground that the roots can bring up the nutrients and bring it into the fruit or vegetable. What, I haven't heard anybody discuss what you're doing to enrich or re-enrich the soil. And specifically to Ralph also, you talked about extending the growing season a bit because of the dry season and the wet. What specifically are, are you doing to extend it? Thank you. Okay, sure. So um, just to review, the first question was on the allocation of funding um, for the, the Shilling Children Initiative. The second question was investments um, compared to the rest of agriculture, specifically cereals. Um, and then the last question was targeted towards Ralph. But um, <coughs> Honorable Pinda, if you'd like to chime in, we do have a microphone if you'd like to respond to any of those questions as well, since one was towards you. <laughs> um, so any, anyone, it's open to whoever would like to go first, respond to, we can go in order of the questions. Um, yeah, all right, yeah. Um, yeah, l let me uh, respond to um, um, uh, Julie's and uh, the other question about soil and, and uh, growing season. Um, so in terms of investment into uh, cereals versus investment in fruits and vegetables, I would propose a complete radical shift in uh, investment, probably <laughs> not surprisingly. Um, but if you would look at a healthy diet, yeah, and what we teach um, in the food-based uh, food dietary guidelines is that if you have your plate, and if you eat, eat your food, you have your starch, and you have your um, vegetables, and you have your proteins. And the starch and the vegetables should be equal amounts. So I propose that <laughs> if what we eat should be equal amount, that in the investment should also be equal amount. Very simple uh, recommendation. Um, so in the other um, answer I want to uh, give is to the, um, uh, the, the, the soil issue and nutrients. Mm -hmm. Sure, yes. So that's a given. Uh, the uh, particular minerals, yeah, the mineral content, calcium, iron, uh, zinc, um, their reflection of uh, not only the vegetable but also the mineral content in the soil. Um, what we um, what we teach and train is that um, we, uh, we promote a circular economy of agriculture. That means that every nutrient, the nutrients that you remove from the soil also return to the soil. Uh, very simply put, uh, um, 
make compost. Yeah. All your your uh, uh, your produce, your your, your waste, uh, your residues, crop residues, including uh, manure, um, turn it in such a way that you re return it to the soil, and that uh, these nutrients are there. Uh, in addition, we also look at varieties. We have one uh, pr um, program that looks particularly at iron content of amaranth, and we look at different varieties in similar um, uh, soils and look at which variety is able to increase, uh, increase the iron content in its leaves more than other varieties. Um, the other question was about uh, extending the growing season. Well. One thing that we haven't mentioned, and I'm very glad that you bring it up, is the issue of water. You cannot grow vegetables without water. Um, and in a lot of the places in, in Tanzania, uh, the water is a huge restricting uh, factor in terms of growing vegetables. So we have developed certain technologies that, such as sack gardens or keyhole gardens, uh, whereby you the, reuse their household water because the households have to buy water in jerry cans coming from uh, miles away, pay for it. So it's an incredibly precious resource. You want to um, make sure that you uh, contain that water into the rooting area of, the, of vegetables through the second uh, keyhole gardens. And if you go in a bit more into commercial, smallholder commercial um, uh, system, um, uh, apply drip kits, um, drip irrigation lines with simple tanks. We have been introducing that even for the, 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 the poor and malnourished in malnourished areas where for a $30 investment you can have a tank plus four drip lines. So in, in greatly increasing the uh, availability of water into the dry season. Sure. Um, for the other questions, uh, Sally or Habtamun, do you have any responses? Um, I would just say on the, the, the question of um, funding, I think you're probably preaching to the choir here. Um, but I think it's also not just about which commodity or crop, because I think we also haven't talked about animal source foods, which we know are incredibly important for the under twos um, and for women. Um, but I think it's also about it, it, expanding how we're looking at it so that we're not just talking about research, but we're also talking about how do you actually take that research into practice and what needs to happen so that all of the, you know, I think the World Vegetable Center is a great example of this, of how you're actually taking new technologies, new practices and taking it out and taking it to scale. And how do we make sure that we're not just investing in um, what to do better, but how to actually have that then uptaken and done sustainably across the board. So I didn't answer your question, but you know, I think you're <laughs> preaching to the fire on that one. Any, any remaining responses? No? OK. Um, OK. Um, let, we'll start with Nima, and then we'll go over there, the microphone over there next. And then uh, John. Well, I have to say, Nima leads the, the foundation. So a huge Hi, job. everyone. I'm Nima Lugangera. I'm the executive director of Agithamani. Um, my boss here sort of ambushed me to answer what the question on cancel, so I'll do my best. Uh, basically, in Tanzania, uh, the government of Tanzania has um, introduced a mandatory budgeting for nutrition at the local government level. So all councils in Tanzania have to budget for um, nutrition, nutrition interventions for children under five. And the amount is 1,000 shillings per child under five. Um, and from our experience with the work that we're doing with Agrithamani, is we've come to realize that in the meetings that tend to decide the budgeting of the councils, nutrition doesn't always get prioritized because there's so many other important agendas. And the people who sit in those meetings and make those decisions are actually politicians. They're ward-level ward councillors. In Kiswahili, we call them diwani. So this is why it forced us to, to try and look at political parties, because the, the ward councillor is going to champion initiatives and priorities that are priorities of the political party that they're representing. So it becomes very important that even when we're talking about increased um, public sector budgeting, you might focus on the government officials alone, forgetting that at that level, decision makers are also politicians. So that's just what I wanted to add in the, in the sense that um, depending on the different areas, you have to look at the different key players 
who can influence those decisions. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to provide nutrition advocacy to the ward councillors so that they can understand the importance of, of nutrition, but also understand the importance of, of um, nutrition against their own prioritized development projects, especially when you're talking about sustainability. For example, the government has in place uh, 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 education, free education for children. So if there's free education for children, but most of the children are stunted, maybe it's going to impact the level of, you know, the level, the, the pass rate, the exam, the, the way the exam, the results are passing, or if you're having development projects, but maybe the youth or the children are not seeing the importance of it and they're doing vandalism. So it's, it's all of that, all of those things to try and sell to the politicians why is nutrition important, but for the politicians to buy in, you need the political parties to endorse that nutrition is a priority for them. So I think yeah. that's what I just wanted to highlight, that it's also very important to look at the different stakeholders and not just those who are like professionals in those specific fields. Thank you. Thank you, and I think it's important that that is the same in the U.S. government as well, is that we need politicians to be advocates for nutrition. Um, the question over here, yeah, Mike, great. <coughs> Larry Schaefer, uh, Schaefer Global Management. Uh, my specific interest is controlled environment agriculture. Um, there's been no conversation about indoor agriculture, aquaponics, hydroponics, any of those uh, for solutions, for all, all the things that you're talking about, for integrated solutions. Um, to address multi-sector stuff, to address integrated farming operations, workforce development, training. I know USAID has funded some serious projects like Southern Jordan Valley, that massive 1,000-acre greenhouse project that they did. Um, but what's the appetite for these kinds of solutions amongst the organizations who can actually implement? Thank you. And then the last question will be uh, John on the aisle right here. Yeah, hi, I'm with the uh, Bureau for Food Security, uh, the research team. Um, a question um, anybody's feel to weigh in, maybe more directed towards Ralph, is about um, kind of large scale, let's say peri-urban scale up of these highly nutritious vegetables like the amaranths and the nightshades. I was just in Ethiopia and our, our mission there is, uh, they've never been really focused on horticulture and now they're thinking about going into it. But what they're thinking about is not so much the, uh, the, the, the backyard garden model, the, the kitchen garden, this kind of thing, but, but, but larger scale, like medium scale, production in peri-urban areas and then and then essentially so you get you get you can get the price down of the vegetables and I think many of us are aware that our very small scale uh, rural beneficiary uh, typical beneficiary of Feed the Future way out in the boondocks the economic analysis seems to show that despite all the efforts to do home gardens, home consumption, that basically these people are, they want to purchase their food. Um, whether it's um, enriched vegetables or eggs or, or meat, the reality is that um, they're pur purchasing very high amounts of their, uh, of their food in the marketplace. So this model of um, efficient, larger scale production of, of amaranth, let's say nightshades, African eggplant, and then efficient value chain distribution to the rural areas. Um, what's, I don't know if you've uh, you know, seen any, any, of, any evidence so far that this, let's say donor investment in this space would be a good idea. I don't know if Save the Children has seen larger scale production. Uh, and I would just like to know what your thinking is on it or maybe if, what are the potential pitfalls. I think it'd be great to get the price down. I think, and of course, AID wants to work on the value chain logistics a lot more these days than production, so that's, that's attractive. Uh, private sector promotion in the peri-urban areas with larger scale production, that's a potential, but there probably are some, some pitfalls. So that's the issue I'd like to raise and see your reaction to it. Would like to start? I, <coughs> I kind of started probably on the the large-scale uh, production. Uh, uh, 
Ethiopia is because of the horticultural plant they have, so they are investing a lot on fruits and vegetables in addition to the other horticulture. The, the main challenge is, you know, those large-scale production, because we don't have infrastructure for market, it's, not, it's, it's going out from a rural area or to the urban areas rather than to the major rural areas. So it's a good strategy for increased production and, and probably lowering the price in urban and uh, the bigger cities. But the problem is there is no infrastructure to, for the rural household who needs really badly needs a, a fruit and vegetable. And that's the challenge, you know, we, we, we have in Ethiopia. But I think the government's more pushing on the large scale production, including the indoor productions are in the peri-urban areas, um, many acres of land are, are given to private uh, sectors to you know, produce. But I think the, the same for value chain is not only fruit, vegetables, the same animal source, livestock, all the livestock, you know, milk, they collected from a community. And it's being you know, sold in the big cities and peri-urban areas, but farmers are selling it. That is their main source of animal for their kids. So how you balance, you know, the distribution is, 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 is a, the main challenge. Otherwise, you know, that's what the governments, I think, these days want is large scale rather than small, you know, uh, gardens because of the, the production is less. So access to water is limited. Uh, the management is difficult. Getting seats, you know, to all those communities is also challenging. So either it's a group production or a large scale production is is the direction I think most government, most of the government, including in, in Ethiopia and others, are, are pursuing. All right. Yeah, uh, I want to follow up on that. And um, I think we have to realize that by um, um, 2035, uh, more than 50% of the world population will live in uh, urban areas. Uh, so the demand for vegetables will actually start to come from, from urban areas. And um, so we there will always be a huge demand in rural areas but it's a different kind of marketing system it's a different kind of value chain um, we're also dealing with a situation whereby um, carbon footprints uh, the uh, the whole idea of um, an energy consumption and, uh, and the carbon footprint per kilogram vegetables is becoming an issue not only in industrialized areas, but also uh, all over the world. We want to not contribute to climate change. Uh, so shortening that value chain and looking at opportunities in peri-urban areas is, um, is something that we, we cannot uh, um, ignore. It's a, it's a huge opportunity, uh, let alone all the, 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 the youth and the, the, the migration, the rural urban migration of young people who are there and who, where business opportunities exist. Um, uh, so yes, this is an area that um, I, th I think in future will uh, be more important and particularly to make our vegetables more affordable uh, and, um, and reduce post-harvest losses. Again, that's uh, because when you shorten the value chain, you'll have fewer losses. You get the vegetables quicker from the producer to the consumer. Uh, so it, it benefits uh, everyone in the food system. Um, I also want uh, to respond to the question about uh, um, controlled environments or protected cultivation. Yes, um, so uh, what we haven't discussed a lot this morning is the, the supply side. So this is an, an incredibly important area where we're dealing with how to improve the supply. Uh, but it also links to nutrition because what um, the beautiful thing about protected cultivation is that you can actually um, use more biological control of pests and diseases whereby you reduce the amount of pesticides on your crops. Now why is this a problem? Particularly in, um, in many African countries the, 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 the monitoring system of pesticide residues on the, on the vegetables for consumers is not very well developed if at all present. Um, so if we can develop a system whereby uh, we uh, remove the need for re, uh, uh, producing, um, ap applying pesticide, uh, that, that would be great. 
So currently uh, we do work in Tanzania, for instance, on protected cultivation, on different kind of structures. Uh, in the end, it all has to be economically viable. In protected, uh, the screen houses are expensive, but there are also cheaper versions of it. And we're looking at applying uh, fungi, um, uh, predators and uh, uh, parasitoids on uh, uh, certain vegetables in collaboration with the private sector. We do this uh, research and looking at the efficacy of these methods to uh, the, the reduction of the pests and diseases. So that's a huge potential. And um, on farm, we also do a little bit with uh, tunnels and we find that uh, cabbages grown in tunnels, in these greenhouse tunnels, are actually fetching higher prices uh, because people know these are cabbages that don't have all such a high amounts of uh, pesticides on it. So it actually already demands a higher co co uh, market price. Anything to add, Sally? No, I don't think John was asking me that okay. question, and that is beyond my wheelhouse as okay. a trained nutritionist, not an Aggie. All right, well, uh, last time to plug the report. Um, it's online, just visit CSIS, the interactive's up. Later in the day, the, the panel discussion, and uh, Asante to uh, Honorable Pinda for, for coming all the way from Tanzania and your keynote, and thank you to the panelists. I think this was a great conversation, and hopefully more people will start talking about the role, of, the importance of fruits and vegetables in nutrition. So thank you.